Art's adventure is about art, artist, and how art is made. So, so stop what you're doing and come on along on our next Art's Adventure. Today we're going to be visiting with Doug and Beth Brown of Potter's Brown in Edom, Texas. And Doug is going to show us how to make pottery. Doug, why don't you tell us what you're going to do? I'm going to make a bowl for you. <clears throat> the first thing I do is, this is called wedging. It's the same thing you do when you bake bread. So what I'm doing is I'm pushing down and turning as I go. And this is the final mixing process to get the clay to be the same moisture content all the way around. Moist, this is a piece of wood that's called a bat. Here you can see what the wheel head looks like without the bat on there. And the reason we use bats is because the pot is going to be so fragile that it cannot be removed from the wheel without distorting it. So you've heard the expression throwing pottery. That's where the throwing comes from. So no matter what you're making, the first thing you have to do is what's called centering. And I'm going to get some goop and I'm going to push down with my left hand and push in with my right hand. And now I'm going to exert pressure and cause the lump of clay to get taller. I'm going to grab some more goop and now I'm going to push down with this left hand and you can see where that clay has been riding on this left hand. As I push down with the left, I push in with the right. And no matter what you make, it starts out the same way. So again, I'm going to exert pressure on the bottom side of it, and I'm going to lift. If the clay is not properly centered when you go to thin the wall, it won't go up properly. Okay. Now I'm going to have to stand up and exert some real pressure. So I'm still doing the same thing. I'm pushing down with the left and pushing in with the right. Okay, that's pretty well centered. Now I'm going to do what's called opening. I'm pushing down with my right palm and I'm trying to feel the thickness of the clay against that bat. If it's too thin, it's not good. If it's too thick, not good either. I've built a small tool here that I will use to check my thickness. So I'm going to get some water out of there so we can see. And how thick do you want it? I want about a quarter of an inch. Okay. So now I have determined that the thickness is proper. I'm going to seal that hole back in. And I'm also going to compress the base of the clay. It's important that that be compressed. Okay. Now I'm going to do what we call opening. Let's see if I can find some tools here, which I'm going to need eventually. This is called a rib. It's made out of wood. And they're called ribs because the original potters used animal bones because they were curved. So this will help me define a shape and it will also help me compress. Now you see I have water in here which I don't want because it will make the pot crack. But I need a little bit for lubrication. 
So now I'm going to push out with the right hand. And I call it throwing and catching. I'm throwing with the right hand and I'm catching with the left. Because this is going to be a bowl, I'm starting off with a low, wide shape. If this is going to be, say, a pitcher, I'll start off with a taller, thinner shape. Basically, it's the same process. And I want to make that real smooth because when I decorate it, I want it to be smooth so I can put my decoration on. Okay, now I'm going to grab with my left hand and I'm going to pinch between my index finger and my thumb and I'm going to push down with my right hand. And as I do that, you'll see that we're going to get a little bit of height out of the piece. Oh, yeah. Now the most important part of a bowl, I think, is this transformation between the bottom of the pot and the side. And I'm also going to use this rib to compress the bottom. A little more lubrication, not much. Now I'm going to set a thickness between my inside hand and my outside hand and by maintaining that thickness and lifting up I thin the wall of the pot. Now I'm also going to press down here because this is the um, pot where the pot, part where the pot is most vulnerable to cracking in the dish water or whatever, so we want it to be strong, so we're going to compress it. Okay, now I'm going to use my rib and I'm going to start shaking. So by throwing with the inside hand, catching with the outside hand, I'm going to shape the wall of the pot. Shaping. So by throwing with the inside Again, I'm compressing the bottom here, making it smooth. Okay, I'm going to apply a little more inside pressure this time. As you can see, there's a little wobble, but that's just part of the, part of the process. Okay, you can see that this pot now has a real sharp edge here. We don't like sharp edges because sharp edges are vulnerable to cracking, chipping. So I'm going to use this goat skin called a chamois, like just like you use on an automobile window. Sharp edge. Okay, now we could call this finished if we wanted to, but what I want is something that has a little more interest and something that gives me the opportunity to decorate. Just like a painting has a frame around it, I think pots need to have frames to contain the interest. So what I'm doing here is I'm laying this lip down a little bit just by pushing down and out. And now I'm going to reset this. Now this is the dangerous part here, because if I go too far, the pot falls down. If I don't go far enough, I don't get the shape that I want. So we'll shimmy this edge again and take a look at it. I want to have a place that contains everything, and that's what this lip does, as well as for me, it creates a more interesting vessel. And unless you've made a pot and taken it too far, and it's fallen down on you, you don't know how far to take it. And so it's always kind of a dance. Shammy down here. Okay, one more time, I'm gonna take this rib and see if I can define this a little more finely. Okay, that's pretty much it. We'll chammy one more time just to make sure that we're smooth. And 
we'll take our sponge, clean off our bat, and get this extra moisture out of the inside here. Now if I tried to pick this pot up, it would just completely fall apart. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this <coughs> wire and we'll pass the wire between the wooden bat and the pot. Now that gives the pot a chance to separate. This pot will shrink a total of 12% from the time it's been made to the time that it comes out of the last firing of the kiln. So, a tool here to separate this. So this will dry for probably oh, 24 hours depending upon the heat and humidity. And then I will invert it and I will trim the excess clay off the bottom. Okay. And then what I will do, what I will do is I will add a foot to it, but that's an entirely different process. Okay. So once you have made your pot or plate or whatever it is that you're going to do, what's the next step? The pot is dried and then it is put in the kiln. Okay. And it's fired to 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. And what that does, it gives it strength. Okay. Okay. Because the materials in the clay have started to melt and glue the clay together. It's called okay. sintering, which is a big word for just means melting. Okay. So okay. now we have some strength. So this pot is strong, but I'm going to stick my tongue on it. Okay, can you see how it's beginning to absorb? Oh yeah. Okay, it's still absorbent. Right, okay. I got you. So what we do? So it'll still suck up water. Glazes are basically rocks and clay that are mixed with water. Okay. Okay. So then we come over here. We first thing we do is we sign it. Okay. And then we come over here and put wax on the bottom. Now that's a combination okay. of paraffin and um, mineral oil heated. So that's. A resist. Oh. Anything okay. that is glazed that touches anything else in the last firing, which is to 2350 degrees, will stick. Okay. So this is called dry footing. The other way is that, and you will see a lot of things that have three little dots on the bottom. And that's because they use little metal prongs to sit right. them up. Um, not a good thing if you're going to make a lot of stuff. You know? It's slow and expensive, and dry footing is the best thing. Okay. Now, after we have signed it, what Beth has done here is she has dipped this pot in glaze, okay? Oh. Now, when it okay. came out of the glaze bucket, it was wet, and within about, I don't know, five or ten seconds, uh -huh. the moisture in the glaze was absorbed by the pot, okay? Okay. And now it's ready to decorate, and that's what Beth is doing now. She's going to de she's decorating the pots. Okay, so Seth, what do you, when you're decorate, what do you do to decorate we a pot? Use, we use what's called the wax resist method of glazing. A lot of people, a lot of potters will spray their pots. We don't do any spraying, any air spraying. Okay. We apply everything by hand. All right. So essentially everything is hand painted. So it's all pretty much one of a kind. Okay. So of uh, I've based this color on here. I usually let that set up overnight. Then I take my hot, this is my hot wax mixture in here. Okay. And I'm going to go around the outside of it because I don't want the glaze to fall off the pot under the kiln shelf. Oh, okay. And I'm going to apply on the top of it. So I'm just going to kind of corral the glaze inside here. Now, wherever I put my wax down, it is going to resist. The glaze that I paint on top of this. So I'm just going to do a very random design okay. using a paintbrush and dripping. And I'm just going to drip oh. this wax on top of here in a very random 
excuse me. Form a very random pattern. So I've done that. It dries pretty much instantly. We prefer to use a hot wax rather than a cold wax. You can buy a lot of cold waxes uh -huh. and apply them, but I don't know. I love the quality of this wax. It resists really well. Um, it's very easy to work with. Okay, so, so I want to make sure I understand. Okay. When you put you put this um, paraffin wax paraffin something? mineral oil mixture okay mm -hmm. on on mm -hmm. top of your pot mm -hmm. and wherever you put it the glaze is not going to stick that's right okay it's going to resist right. it hang on my wax All just right. turned off oh, okay <clears throat> So okay. now I'm gonna put the now I'm gonna put the glazes on. I'm gonna top them. Okay. So over here I have all my colors of glaze in buckets which have names written on top okay. of them because as you can see these do not have much color. Right, they kind of look similar. S they do. So I have to see in color. And okay. I know which colors I'm picking up. This is a grape colored glaze on here, kind of a eggplant color. Okay, all right. So I'm going to take that glaze and I'm going to come over here and I'm going to just start painting on here. Now you can see oh, where yeah. this wax is resisting this color that I'm painting. I have to put it on, most colors I have to put on fairly thick. Right. You have to know your glazes. We make, uh, Doug makes all of our glazes for right. us. We don't use anything commercial all right. in the shop. So he makes all of our glazes for us. And you have to know your glazes. You have to know which ones to put on thin, which ones to put on thick, which ones run more than other ones, which ones don't. Because if you're working on a vertical pot, Right. And you put a glaze that runs too much and you put it down here, it's going to run off on your kiln oh, shelf. I see. Yeah. So you have to put a glaze on the outside, which isn't going to run very much. You just have to know all of those things. Okay, okay, this is pretty much the color that it is. It's sort of a, it's kind of a gold color. Right. Once okay. it gets put on here. So, I'm, and I also like to overlap my colors a little bit because okay. that creates another color onto itself when you overlap. Now I'm pretty messy here. I don't paint within the lines. I right. don't want to paint within the lines because as I said, I'm not going to overlap. Okay. This is a red here. Okay. It's All a right. red color. Come over here. Paint some red on here. Now the red I put on is probably the thickest application that I put on. Right. is pretty much the color it comes out to. It's sort of a teal green. It looks really nice right up against the red. And it looks really nice when it overlaps on the red a little bit. This is a white. Kind of, it comes off as not a, a white white. It's kind right. of an off white. But this brightens things up a little bit. So I'm going to put some of that on. Brighten it up a little. This is a sky blue. And it's also real nice when it overlaps on the white. And that's pretty much it. So I'm going to wipe off my edges. Okay. Now I have covered up some of that wax, but when right. this gets fired, that wa the glaze is going to kind of fall off of there and the wax is still going to shine through. All right. So let me show you a finished piece here. Okay. This is a finished piece. So you can see all the different colors. Let me wipe that off a little right. bit. Yeah. You can see all the different colors. This is the gold. Now you can see the wax lines here. Right. See this was based in this copper color. Right. And then I came back and I 
did the same thing I did here. I plotted, plotted in a very random fashion. Right. Uh -huh. And this is where the wax has burned off and you see that underglaze coming through. And these, they're just like little drops of wax, but uh -huh. they create something very interesting in there. All of these little drops of wax. And these are where colors overlap and they get a really, look at that, isn't that, that's just such a neat little, little action going on there mm -hmm. with the red and the teal mixing together and the the blue over the red and the light blue over the red. It's just really nice how colors interact with one another. So that's kind of how it looks when we open the kiln and what a difference, huh? Boy, no kidding. What a difference. Awesome. And then I can do, I can do some uh, very um, graphic patterns too. Um, here's another piece here, and I can do um, the flatter the piece, the more the glaze stays where I put it. Because okay. I mentioned that they're very fluid, the more vertical the piece, the more the glaze is going to run. Right, okay. So when I get a flat piece like this, I'm touching up the side of this because the more the glaze is knocked off there. Okay, so now I'm going to do more of a graphic okay, you're putting, style. Okay, putting Again, the paraffin around the edges. Putting it on the edge. Paraffin is just like grandma's silver jelly jars. Yeah, it's just um, it's golf oh. wax. It's this golf wax. You can buy this in the grocery store. Uh huh. Right. And then I like to mix it with a mineral oil because it makes it a uh, um, nice fluidity to it. Okay. And we heat it to 200 degrees. Okay. It's just what we like. So. Okay, this one I'm going to make a little bit more random. And there is a problem that will actually explode at about 500 degrees. Oh, wow. So, and we and we vent it so we maintain the temperature at 200. Uh -huh. and keep it vented. Yes, you do have to, you do need to have this vented. And okay. temperature control. Now I'm just going to do this one in two colors. Okay. This is a black glaze and I'm going to do it using the white and the gold together. It's a it's very simple. It's a popular combination. It goes with a lot of granite countertops and it seems to be a uh -huh. a real popular color combination. Right. So I'm just going to do a spiral pattern here with my wax. in the hot wax this brush has seen better days so if you sat in the hot oil all day long I guess you'd see better days too okay awesome so I'm going to do the gold on the inside and a white border. This is my gold glaze. Now I could, you can see where this isn't great at resisting this yeah. color, the wax isn't, it's really going on top of it, but once it gets fired, it will come off of there. Now right. I could take a skinny little sponge and I could get real anal about it and I could wipe it off of there, but I really don't need to. Yeah. You can see I could take this sponge and just go oh, like yeah. this and get it all off of there, but it's gonna, it'll burn off. I'm going to take the white on the outside. I like to pick the 
this up. This is a nice sight. Now this tray was slab roll. This was not done on the wheel. Okay. Obviously. Yeah. Right. It's not yeah. a bowl of any kind. It was just slabbed and I just cut a rectangle. I turned up the sides and there you have a nice platter. A little platter for appetizers and things. You don't have to make things on the wheel. coat on this. Now if I put this white on thinner, it would kind of go gray. Oh. So that's pretty much it. Okay. This kiln was built in California in 1956. Okay. And I have rebuilt it a couple times. Oh. There are shelves that get put in there with bricks in between them, so it's like building a skyscraper. Right. And then we get to the top, close the door, and turn on the gas. Wow. And it fires for about 20 hours, and it cools for about 48 hours. So it takes about three days yeah. for the firing. It takes yeah. you. Know, it's like anything else. It takes as long as it takes. Right. But three days, yeah, to cool, to heat and cool. Okay. And how? It's a gas fire. Yes, there are four burners. There's one of the burners down there, which you can't see very good. But there four, there's a burner on each corner. And one of the reasons I came here was because of the natural gas. I had fired with wood, I had fired with oil, and natural gas is just so much more convenient. Okay. And it gives me the results that I want to get. I have electric kilns that I use for the bisque fire, which is that first fire, but you can't get the colors that I like to get in electric kilns. And the reason that we get the colors that we get is because at a certain point in the fire you reduce the air going into the kiln. And that causes the gas to remove molecules of oxygen from the clay and glaze. And it changes the colors. And if you want, I can show you inside the result of the result of that. Say that again. Okay. Here we have what's called a neutral atmosphere, where all of the gas is being consumed, okay? Okay. And as we go over here, we're getting a partial reduction. So the flame is removing molecules of oxygen from the clay and glaze, okay? And as we go over to here, we're getting what's called a full reduction, okay? So this is the same glaze on the same pot, just it was right in front of one of the burners. So, you know, if, if you want this color, you fire the way you want that way. You know, if you want that color, you fire it a different way. If you want this color, you fire it a different way. So depending upon the atmosphere in the kiln, a glaze will give you all kinds of different results. This is what I like. This is what I go for. Okay. And this is what the pot would look like when it comes out of the kiln and it's ready to be sold. Awesome. And what I've done is I've added the foot on the bottom of this one. And that allows it to sit up off a table, which gives it a little more visual interest. That's our program for today. We'd like to thank our sponsors for making this program possible. And we'd like to thank you, our audience. We look forward to seeing you again when we embark on another arts adventure.